One of them was dealing with, I wonder if you can just kind of help and maybe talk about this so that the audience can have a better idea. But um, I found it quite interesting and it helped me really understand what the book was about when you talked about me, we, and community. Um, there was also the, uh, the idea about greenhouses um, as a theme. Uh, and then uh, ha happiness heartbeat. Um, is there anything about any of those concepts that you couldn't explore in the book because you just didn't have either the the time or um, it, it just didn't make sense to put it in the book that you can talk about now um, that you can go deeper in any of those? I mean, it was for, or even describe the concepts for the audience and then um, and maybe go a little bit deeper. Yeah, um, there's a lot, of, a lot of layers to that question. Um, because the whole me, we community model, if you can imagine concentric circles, what we've done in terms of our frameworks for, for organizations and companies and now governments and hospitals and all that is like, you start with the me, you ripple to the we, which are your teams and organizations, and then your community, which consists of your customers, your partners, your vendors, and eventually, like basically everyone you touch in your ecosystem. At the very beginning of it all, we just had all those concentric circles because we knew it interrelated and interconnected. But what we realized in the most near recent, especially in the last few years, is that it all starts with the me. And what I mean by that is like leaders from every level of organization, whether at the C-level or the frontliners, like a janitor at um, Northwell Health, which I talk about, and how when they actually get real with themselves and they like everyone has their way to go about it, but essentially it's just getting honest and real with themselves. That's when they actually understand what it means to live a more meaningful, purposeful life driven by their values. And that's when the light bulb goes off of how they ripple that out because they're being honest and real with themselves. So that's been working really well. I think to your question of what I couldn't quite, um, if I didn't quite address something, the jury's still out. And the reason why is because if you can imagine, so Tony Shea, he was like my co-founder of Delivering Happiness, he, uh, the late CEO of Zappos. He passed away um, five weeks before the book was due. And so if you can imagine, I mean, we all live 2020, right? It was like a universal, like, like we had pandemic, recession, global like social unrest, and we all suffered some form of loss. And mine, you know, happened to be Tony at the end of the year. And so every time something happened, the book wasn't enough. And so that's a very interesting question because no one ever asked me that, like, what to have I not put in there? But I think if I was to truly be just be present as I was processing everything at the same time, I think that's why it's called Beyond Happiness. No, I know that's why it's called Beyond Happiness because I knew it had to be more than what it was before. In stretching the thoughts around like perception of happiness, it's not rainbows and unicorns, no, it's actually not just your highs, it's also your lows and actually being at peace and still with those moments. Any form of loss that we've had, not just like in the form of a human being, but loss of expectation, loss of hope, loss of autonomy, you know, everyone experienced some form of loss. So going back to your question, sorry for this long-winded answer, it's, I'm such, I'm so curious now what it means to be able to address those things today. I, I've, I'm being, trying to be thoughtful and, and, and uh, conscious about talking about Tony, because I do, there are quite a few things I do want to bring up uh, as he was, you know, uh, both of our friends for quite a while. And I, you know, I've known him since 98 and we lived together and uh, I knew the same, but, um, you, you mentioned something uh, in the book and you, t you, you said that you uh, were concerned that you might not be able to do the book justice or you might not be able to do uh, to or, uh, deal with Tony's legacy um, in a way that you felt honored him properly or, uh, and you clearly got over that because you did it and you did a phenomenal job with that. And I'm wondering, um, how did you get over it? And what, what, how, how did you get through 
thinking that you might not be able to have, or you might not have the wherewithal to, to, um, to do, to do those, handle those topics in a, in a just fashion. Yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't even say honestly to myself that I've gotten over it. I think I had to literally take it day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, because I knew there were deadlines and there were things that were going on around, like with the company and all that, let alone the fact that, you know, we lost one of our best buds and it was a very public loss. And so I really, um, it, I tested, I had to test myself and all the theories and the concepts and the science of it, like, is it really true? And one of, um, before I uh, so for, before I went to uh, I, I I had tried to reminisce a little bit about going to Tahoe to write the book because that's where Tony and I wrote Delivering Happiness. On my way there, someone sent me this book called um, The War of Art. And if anyone's heard of this book, it's just a screenwriter. He talks about what the war of art is, and of course, he's not talking about just writing a book or a screenplay. He's talking about the war of art of our lives, a creation of expression, of um, being entrepreneurs. And this was all, you know, before everything happened and all those things became true because it truly is the test of like who you really are. If you're going to go down this path and truly bear your soul and things that you did not even know about yourself, um, are you going to take that challenge? And it is a daily, he calls it resistance, but it's a daily sort of uh, addressing of it and asking, are you going to be able to do this and do you want to take this on? So it's kind of like the hero's journey of like every day. It was such a battle. And I, I I had to come to peace with, you know, did I, when I, when I finished this book, did I think it was like, yay, <laughs> no, like congratulations. This really, no, I was like, oh shit. Like that was the hardest thing that I ever done. And it's because of just all those different extremes that I think we all as human beings go through when we truly get to the core of who we are and want to express what's most meaningful for us um, and for people we love. I want to I want to talk about Tony again in a little bit, but right now you spent a lot of time um, expressing how important your your trip to Africa was, and when you climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. You did that with Tony, and when you were in the village prior to prior to making the climb, you talked a lot about spending time with some of the locals. And these are clearly, you know, folks who are not, you know, do not have a lot of means, right? And yet, you said one thing. You said that in the book was that they were, nonetheless, they were quite happy. Yeah, and uh, I also spent some time in Africa, and I remember the exact same sentiment that you know they didn't. They, everybody had enough to eat, and you know their homes weren't necessary. They they were not typically you know um, things that you know, our homes that we would find you know have all the creature comforts that we're used to. Yeah. Um, but but they were very happy. And the one thing that I remembered is that we. Um, with a, and it made me think about a whole bunch of different things. But uh, as we walked, as uh, with some of the locals, where I was in the Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, and I remember walking down the street. This is the first time this ever happened to me. Pardon my back, by the way. Let me scoot over this way. Um, I remember the guy grabbing my hand, and we walked down the street together, holding hands, and um, and it was uncomfortable initially because it's not what you know if you're. A, heterosexual male is just kind of not what you do. Um, but I, I learned to love it and it just warmed my heart yeah. to, um, to be able to have that experience. Um, and again, but the, 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 the bigger point though was that the people there were very happy. And I'm wondering, is it because they are not used to having all the, you know, materialistic things that we are used to? Is that why you think they're happy without, um, Without you know you know those that that fleeting happiness that we're so used to yeah. here that you talk about in the book. Yeah, I mean that's it's pretty awesome. You had that experience as well. Like just to put a little bit of context to, I think the at the time that I went through that um, moment, that was you know Kilimanjaro 
um, back in the day. This this happened like after I got laid off from, like, basically got spit out from the dot com book bust. Nine uh, eleven happened, and then my dad was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer, all within one, about a year. And so, you know, I was pretty defeated about, you know, nothing that made sense anymore. And this is before scientific happiness, before all the stuff that um, we were looking into. And so we were going around this and this this hut, neighborhood of huts made of cow dung, you know, like, and we would just walk in with our guide and, and he would introduce us. And basically, I mean, they had nothing, but whatever they had, they would share, like tea and biscuits. But what struck me, especially in that moment in my life of like not really understanding, like where was humanity? These people's happiness, it just exuded in a way that I had not really seen here. And like you could see in the crow's feet of their eyes, and it was just it just totally floored me of what happiness could mean. And to that question, it wasn't because they didn't know, you know, what material wealth is. It's like, you know, you walk around and you'll see, um, you know, Nike ads and McDonald ads, or uh, like Michael Jordan as posters uh, for people that you know, for kids to aspire to. So it's not like they didn't know about it. So that's what also struck me too. It's like they knew about it, but they didn't really need it to be in that space of happiness. So, so does that mean they were, could that mean that they are more enlightened than, than we are since they, they know about it or yeah. they knew about it the same way we do and yet yeah. they're, they're happy without it? I think in some ways it's like if, um, if you all are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy, like, you know, like this whole pyramid and at the very top is this self-actualization, I think. And then at the very end, before actually Lee and Maslow passed away, it wasn't self-actualization at the top, which is finding your own purpose. He actually said there's another layer called transcendence. And transcendence is when you actually want others to self-actualize and you help them self-actualize as you're self-actualizing yourself. So I think there's something to that because of, I mean, that's from a psychological standpoint, but just there's this sense of being not to exist just for yourself, but to exist for others in tandem, you know, and like coexistence in, 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 in balance. So I think there's something to be said in that, like old school villages, you know, like where you came from, where I came from in Toys on, you know, like it's different. You know, yeah, guys can hold their hands because, you know, it's just they're just friends, whatever it is. But there's something I think we can learn about the, the old school village mentality. Yeah, uh, I think that's right. And I certainly learned it when I was there. So um, you talked about a couple of different janitors too in the book. And uh, I think I think one of them might be fictitious, and um, and you can talk about it. But it was um, it was. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I feel so bad for you guys. I'm sitting here. <laughs> I'm just gonna do this. Uh, uh, the, so the you can tell the story, and then I, I'll ask the question about the janitor. Just tell them how the the, the, the the real one or the fake one. No, the fake one. The fake the fake one. <laughs> Oh, the fake one. So uh, I think a lot of people have heard this story too. It's like the whole JFK thing of when he was walking around the halls of NASA. And, you know, this is like business school type of story where like, oh yeah, and, and JFK saw a janitor sweeping the floor and said, he asked them like, what are you doing, sir? And the, and the janitor said, um, I'm sending a man to the moon. And I mean, everyone gets chills when they hear that story, but everyone doesn't really know if it's true. Like that's the whole thing of whether this guy was really... Uh, this janitor said that, but it became folklore and it inspires people to this day. And so that's why I was just like, isn't it cool though that it's actually true? Like the other janitor, the real janitor is uh, someone that is doing that. Like one of our clients is Northwell Health, uh, it's a hospital system in upstate New York, like, eight, like maybe 75,000 employees now. Incredible story of how they, you know, really instilled core values, purpose within every level of the organization. And this guy, this janitor, basically a custodian for patients' rooms, 
um, he just did his job every day. And so one of his patients, when he got discharged, uh, and the janitor's name is Louise, um, his son, who's a doctor, the son asked the patient, hey, dad, like, how was your stay at the hospital? And he's like, it was great. It was amazing. And it was like, this is the doctor, the son. He's like, how can anyone think this is an amazing experience to be sick? Because he was still sick. And he's like, his dad said, it was because of Louise. Louise came into my room every day and brought me the paper, the sports section, because he knew that I loved the Mets. And so every day we had a conversation of what happened in the last ball game and all that. And through that action, he had a great time, you know, at the hospital, even though he was still sick. So at the end of the day, like the janitor's story of, you know, the, the person in NASA, whether it's true or not, it's inspiring. But what inspires me now more than ever is that what's actually happening today where Louise is living his purpose by being a janitor and helping his patients actually have a better day and be feel you know, happier in a very unfortunate circumstance. So around that, the wage structure for people like Louise and, and the fictitious janitor at Nassau is such that there's no major city in, in, the, in the U.S. where a worker like that can you know, afford a one-bedroom apartment, let alone purchase a home. And I'm wondering, um, like, how do you reconcile that with some of the arguments that you make in the book? And, like, doesn't, doesn't leadership need to wrestle with the idea that, um, that, these, that, you know, these harsh realities exist? Uh, and almost, I, I, I don't know, I mean, it wasn't, certainly wasn't the, the point of the book, but it feels a little... Um, I was I was struck at the fact that you know even though we brought those examples up and we talked about them, as relates to the larger, you know, uh, the bigger picture in the book, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily. I don't know if it has the same effect, you know, on the janitors. I mean, they they can't self actualize. They're they're dealing with some really base concerns. I mean, I can imagine that that janitor um, and maybe his kids or maybe you know, uh, his spouse or whatnot have similar kinds of jobs and or he himself is working another job and they just don't. And, and so then how do you get that person up that um, that hierarchy to a point where they can start participating in some of these things that we, that, that you, some of these concepts that you bring up? Yeah. <clears throat> Your questions are very thoughtful and thorough, by the way. <laughs> like every one of them, we could take like another hour to talk about because it's so... I mean, it's it's uh, it's on point, you know. Like the reality is that there's just no like it's there's no one bullet solution to all these things. But what I have been seeing is that when we start bringing in these concepts of not just happiness but humanity to the workplace, that's when these kind of things can be addressed. So Louise might not be saying in his head like, oh, I feel like I've transcended or I'm self-actualized, but is he happy? He feels like he's living a purposeful life? Yes. And I have other examples in the book, uh, uh, in the book of others as well. But I think as leaders, like, there's one big thing that we've seen, especially since 2020, of this line being drawn of where are we going to stand? And it's kind of like uh, the Hamilton thing right like what will you fall for <laughs> you know? and I saw leaders that went one way and I saw leaders that went the other and I believe that you know people char true character comes when tragedy happens true of companies come out when chaos and tragedy happens too so what's great you know silver lining is that Companies are all laid to bear. When they said, hey, you have to come into the office, you know, there's no choice of the matter, no hybrid remote, that's their stand. And that's okay. And that's why we have the great resignation. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, thank you, but no thank you. And so I believe there's a democratization going on. And because of that, then even though you can't fill that gap like that, 
but in, I mean, socioeconomically and all these things that we talk about inequality and inclusion, but at least we are seeing leaders step up to who they want to be because they want to live a truth in their own purpose and values and be a good example for their kids, for their, you know, employees, et cetera. So at least that visibility is getting bigger. Um, but it's just, I think it's just going to, it's a continuous journey on how to get there. Jen, you, um, you talk quite a bit about authenticity um, and you, you make it, you put it out there as if it's easy. Hmm. <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> well, well, you use it. Well, you, well, you said it often. It was it was a c consistent theme throughout the book. It was a thread being being your authentic self. And as I think about that, for Louise is one thing. It's it's easy for us to understand that. I think it's easy for people to understand that him being authentic could be difficult. But if you put that, I mean, uh, but if you put that same lens on and look at it from my perspective as someone who, you know, has, this is gonna sound horribly, um, like I'm bragging or something, but someone who has, you know, I have three degrees from two different Ivy League institutions, right? Two masters and, a, and an undergraduate degree. And I can't be authentic at work when I was in investment banking at Merrill. Because if I were, I'd be telling people how racist they were. <laughs> so I had to deal with, you know, pushing those things down as a, so one, I'm black, in case. <laughs> but, but, I, but I'm also. Zero tolerance for racism here, please. <laughs> Next. <laughs> uh, I'm also darker complected, which, which is a thing. And I and my and my 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 voice is oftentimes deeper, um, uh, and perhaps my gait is confident, and that doesn't sit well with some people. And and as a result, you know, I find myself. Uh, you didn't call it this in the book. You, I don't remember what you called it, but effectively, it's code switching. And you were, I think, one of the points you were making is that. Be authentic and don't code switch. And and if and if I didn't do that, if I if I was truly authentic, I wouldn't have I would not I wouldn't be here now because I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been able to keep my job for as long as I did and and have all the great things that came with uh, an investment banking career when you can make money in investment banking. Um, so I'm one. Can you can you talk about that? I don't really have a question, but can you can you rectify some of these concerns? With it, I mean, it's. I said a lot. Shit, didn't I say a lot? <laughs> deal with it. I want, I want to hear how you deal with it. Well, I can ask a question too. <laughs> Every question, is like we could spend an hour on it. Uh, no, in, in a good, good way. Um, uh, and, um, <laughs> where do I start with that? Other than the fact, like, congratulations on your success. That's 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 now a little blow. That's a little blow. <laughs> that's, a, that's a low blow. Now we know how you got there. You freaking. <laughs> uh, no. Um, yeah, like, I did not mean to imply that it's easy to be authentic at all. Because I don't know if you notice I'm I'm Asian. <laughs> and I'm actually a woman. Wait, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> so I think. I mean, we've known each other for so long, and I think we've had a lot of these long, you know, late night conversations about this. Because I, mean, I was, you went the banking route, I went the consulting route at KPMG, and you know, I fought so hard to like not be Asian women and like trying to prove myself. All I just wanted to do is add value and be me, and not be known for anything else. And so I fought for that so hard and so long, and I thought I was succeeding in, in those ways. But then I realized, and even to the level, and even to the time, um, you know, after going through that and then said, you know, sorry, fuck this shit. I'm not going to deal with this anymore because I got laid off for so, like, like 
working my ass off for someone that didn't really care about me. So that's why I became an independent consultant. And that's when I started saying, this is when I can be real. Like I was just working for myself because I didn't want to go back to that world. And I think now we have a lot more visibility, a lot more, um, even though we don't, even though we know that things are not fair and equal, all things being said, but you know, compared to when we were 10, 15 years ago, at least we can have these conversations and have the uncomfortable conversations we never had before. So yeah, it's not easy being authentic, but I think that's why I'm so passionate about this work and so passionate about what I wrote about in the book about purpose and values is like when we can get to that self then it doesn't matter what's going on in the environment as much because at least, you know, with the great resignation and just like our awareness of choices and awareness of self, then at least we can guide ourselves through these, as we know, you know, very unequal, crazy chaotic waters at times. So um, I think there's something to be said in that, that it becomes this proverbial journey but unless we do that upfront work, or it's a journey of work too, but of really getting to the nitty gritty of who we are in the core of what we stand up for, like, you know, do you feel now that you're living up to your purpose and values and being as authentic as you are today? Do you feel it? I'm not answering that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking the question. <laughs> Not you. This is the power mic right here. <laughs> um, All right, I'll ask later. Um, yeah. But uh, did that answer your non question? Yes, it did not answer the non answer <laughs> I to the question, the question that I didn't was, ask. Yes. But yeah. Um, I, w I actually have no idea how long we've been here. Yeah. <laughs> like, I have no idea if we're like four hours over or we've only been going for two minutes. I don't know. Um, but I'm going to ask this question anyway. Okay. Um, and it's about Tony. Okay. Should we check the time though, just in case? What does that mean? That means when do we start? How Seven? much time do we have? Oh, okay, we got we got time. Unless Six you guys seven. are <laughs> bored shitless, <laughs> like want me to stop? I could do that too. Um, uh, Sorry, you're asking. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You um, you talked earlier on about um, getting to the top of the mountain. And you looked over, and Tony had his sunglasses on. And you realized that, you know, you guys, you guys peaked, and you realized that he was crying. He was crying. And you said that that was the first time you saw him cry. And you'd known him for, some, for obviously a long time, even by then. Um, you clearly you know my uh, my wife passed away and tony tony uh, came to the uh, to the memorial that we that we had for my wife in chicago he flew out for that and and i spoke and you know shared stories about my wife and i didn't know this but at the end uh my partner kirby business uh came came to me and said dude Tony was crying. Uh, and then I saw Tony a little bit later, and, and sure enough, he had been crying. Um, and we both were in Utah to visit Tony um, at the, you know, not, you know, shortly before he, uh, he left us. Uh, and we spent we spent time there with him. And I, one of the things I did when I was with him, which is not typical, is that what happens with, uh, or what happened with Tony, he would he would oftentimes have friends with him, and it wasn't, you know, it was it was not for a lot of people. It wasn't uh, always obvious that you can get time with him alone, even even some friends. So uh, while while we were in Utah, I was able to spend a little bit of time with Tony, uh, just he and I. Um, and I was able to tell him uh, at that point how important he was in my life and how he shaped a lot of things in my life and, and, uh, and, uh, and that I was grateful and thankful for him and his friendship. You were there at the same time. You weren't in the room with me at that point. How did you deal with 
like for me, that was closure. I look, I look back at that and I, I can say, I, you know, I, I was able to speak my piece in a way that, that felt real and great. And, and, um, I was able to tell him stuff that you typically wouldn't tell him because it's just kind of not how he was. And I'm wondering if you have any, uh, anything to say about how you've dealt with his passing and if you've actually dealt with it from, uh, if you feel like you had a, a chance to, to close with him. <laughs> Yet another <laughs> crazy deep question. Um, so if I was to go back to the last time I saw him in Park City, the short answer would be no, I did not have closure. Knowing how long I've known him for, um, I just didn't believe, and we talked about this, I just did not believe that was him any longer. So, you know, we went through a lot of conversations and trying to say, hey, what are we doing? Like, what is, what is, what is, what's happening and what do we do about it? And that was, I'd have to say, like, you know, like, I had to go through a lot of <sighs> processing of that period, let alone the fact of, like, all that happened prior to that. So in a lot of ways, I think, um, you know, you having lost your wife too young to cancer, Tony is too young, and all the fact that we all lose people and, um, you know, situations that get us to this moment of losing, of, of, of some form of grief, different form of grief, grief and loss. I think somehow this book was a forcing function to process it and try and honor it. And especially after like losing my dad when you know, he was too young, we go through these events and there's something about, and what I really wanted to capture in the book, and I just didn't know it was gonna have to be for Tony, this being uh, real and at peace with our opposites of happiness, you know, like the other places that life takes us. But when we are at peace with it, how truly that brings us to a different level of really living life fully. Uh, you know, like there's a Buddhist belief that life is suffering and life's happiness is in the present. And those seem to be at opposite ends, but if you accept them to be true, then that basically describes every single moment of our, of our days. So, so now, I mean, I think that it becomes a journey, you know, the, the whole like time heals all wounds is bullshit. You know, right? We think about people all the time, but when we embrace it that way, there's this some sort of uh, beauty in in not just life but also grief, because it teaches us so much more about, well, for me, the extent of happiness and how to really capture what we can do in in our everyday world. But um, thanks for going there, man. I didn't. Um, aren't you not, you're not supposed to say, um, I do that a lot, I think. Uh, Did you notice? No, um, I don't. Mm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to allow this beautiful audience to ask questions of you, but I have one more. <laughs> this guy just won't stop. <laughs> I have one more. It's like. Yeah. <clears throat> can you uh, can you tell these folks the story that we've gone back to a hundred times, if not more, uh, in Las? I'll, you know, set the scene. We were in Las Vegas. <laughs> 
I think we were at, I think we were, I think it was a probably a Zappos meeting or something, all, or like a year in rep party, not rep party, but. Like a vendor party? Uh, yeah, a vendor party. Was it at the Palms? At the Palms, oh, yeah, right. the, at the penthouse in the Palms. And um, How did I know you are going to bring this one up? <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling. Why don't you, can you just tell the folks, this is how we talked about, or I talked about in the beginning how close we were. This is, um, this is kind of the beginning of, of this yeah. closeness. That's how, I mean, this, this story is going to make me look like a total asshole though. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least I won't brag about my success. <laughs> <laughs> that makes you, <laughs> it was for a point and you are being an asshole. <laughs> But you're my asshole. Yeah. <laughs> you don't even go there. Um, okay, so I was a totally an asshole at this. Because so we were friends for some years. I mean, it's weird how we got like met because your girlfriend at the time, uh, eventually wife, we lived in the same apartment building in Emeryville. So we would see each other in the parking lot and wave. And so we just see each other random places. And then once in a while, we'd go party in Vegas or whatever. And so we were at the Palms. And this is like one of those typical nights that it was like almost dawn. And <laughs> that, that already sounded like an asshole <laughs> thing to say. Um, and so it, we were just hanging out and just talking, having a really deep conversation. And I don't know why I was so compelled. There was a pitcher of water. Actually, yeah. I can recreate it. There was a pitcher of water with ice in it, and we were hot. You know, we were just like dancing, I think maybe, or it was it was just you know one of those nights. And then I said, Eric, so yeah, what's up? Is it okay if I pour this pitcher of water on top of your head? Yeah. <laughs> And I did. I mean, I had no good reason, but I just felt like, like maybe he might want it, or I just felt like doing yeah, it. Yeah, no. 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 <laughs> but he was just so down, you know, like when you have some, like some sort of relationship where people are like, sure. So, and then I got you a towel, and you kind of. I remember that part. I but, remember okay. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want to recreate it? Maybe. Maybe. So um, uh, that yeah. just describes how amazing this successful guy is like he's he's like a really good guy <laughs> you believe that? Um, why don't we change the subject <laughs> and see if you guys have any questions and uh and if so I'll, I'll try to see you i can't see like anything over there but um ah, i can see you here you go right behind you can, can we get like the two minute summary of the book because a lot of awesome questions, a lot of heartfelt, thoughtful responses, deep and interesting stuff. But like, what's the message? Do you not want to read it? Is that why? <laughs> yeah, we, we kind of did it at the question. beginning. It was pretty short, though. Yeah, I wrote the question I said at the beginning. Can you synopsize the book? That was kind of. Yeah, that was it. Book. It was because he said in thirty seconds. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's been so interesting to hear how people read it. Some people read it as a, a business book. Some people read it as organizational design. Um, and some people are like, "Holy shit, that was like an interesting sort of perspective on today's society and how we can actually grow." Um, and one of the themes of the book is how do you nurture your own greenhouse as you grow others. So that, I think, one is one of the major themes of, like, we're so, as leaders, like, we're so used to wanting gr to grow businesses, profits, companies, whatever it is, uh, teams. But that was one of the main things I learned is just, like, we forget about nurturing our own greenhouse along the way. People may not know what greenhouse or a greenhouse is. Or do, I don't, maybe, I don't know. Can you talk about it a little bit? I or do you guys know, know what a greenhouse is? <laughs> like, metaphorically. Um, so, so one of the things that uh, we talked about back in the day, and Tony was a big um, proponent of this, is like we as leaders uh, are here to grow and build greenhouses. So, like you know, whatever it is that we're working on, project-wise, company-wise, team-wise. So we are here to grow greenhouses, but we don't necessarily need to be the tallest plant or the biggest tree. But we're building the conditions so that others can flourish. 
And so that was the build. Like that was something we've been doing for a while and, and totally believe in. But then with the last couple of years of what I saw, I just had to add and remind ourselves that, hey, like unless we do the work, the hard work of understanding what we need for our own greenhouse, then we don't even really know what that means. Like self-love, self-care, you know, using your Calm app, you know, those are all important things, but what for to what end, you know, like what, how is it really impacting our lives in the most fundamental way? So that's one of the points of the book is to understand ourselves so that we know how we go about nurturing our greenhouse too. Was that helpful? So you don't have to read the book. <laughs> how about in the back? Yeah. Hi, you talk a lot about community and purpose. And before the pandemic, I, I run a business with one other person and we all went to an office together and we laughed and we um, felt like a community. And then since COVID, it's been really hard to know how people are feeling. We try to tap in, but how do you build that community when people are all remote and working in their little silos and in their homes? And I'm just a little lost on that one. Yeah. Good and bad news, you're not the only one. So you have a community of that. <laughs> um, one thing I want to remind everyone is that there are super successful companies that were fully remote even before COVID hit. And there's so much to learn from that. So one of our buds, Matt Mullenweg, has a company. He started WordPress long time ago. And now it's automatic is in a company's name and it's like $3 billion valuation. So anyway, he's always been remote and they're global, like truly global. And they're too, like truly purposeful as well. So just it's like a quick reminder, like this is not the first time we've seen it done. Um, the other part of it is that um, you can still build these like meaningful relationships and true connectedness online. Like we were forced to do that, you know, during COVID and all that when we couldn't see each other. It's like, so people got married and we're like, oh, let's, let's watch the wedding or like someone graduated, oh, let's watch. So there was still some sort of connection there. But for businesses and teams, what I talk about in the book is by having these purpose and values exercises so that you're not only doing it for yourself, just test it, like test it with like, let's see, five or 10 people on your team. Ask everyone to do it for themselves. And so what's interesting is that they identify it within themselves because they're getting to know their me, their core self. But also when you start sharing these things across the room, the Zoom room or Zoom land, whatever it is, you'd be amazed how people connect so deep, so much deeper because there's so much overlap on their values, and on their sense of purposes. So that's what I think is so crucial, especially right now, to bring these conversations back to that deeper meaning rather than like, you know, what are you binging on Netflix? What's your happy hour drink tonight? You know, that kind of thing. Um, because they're getting to know each other in that most meaningful way. So that's my first suggestion there. Um, oh, right here, please. Jen, I'm wondering if you could share with us one of your personal favorite exercises that team that you have teams do to build or to get clear about their purpose and values. Favorite, there's so many. Um, I think kind of like uh, pretty similar to what I just shared right now. Um, I think that's still my favorite um, and why especially now is because there's been so many conversations that I've had since 2020 of like from sea levels to frontliners asking like, I don't even know how to define my happiness anymore. I'm not even sure what it is. Like, am I spending my time right? You know, what is like these very fundamental questions. Like it's, it just really brought me to this place where everyone's kind of asking very similar stuff of, am I really spending the moments of my day meaningfully? So that's why that exercise is so cool, which is called purpose and values alignment, like not rocket science. But when you have these conversations and you really hear people out, people just want to be heard, understood, and you know, connect and love, be loved. But it's just amazing what people are willing to share now. 
um, if you're really willing to, you know, want to sincerely, authentically uh, listen. So I think that's what people are really thirsting for um, besides their happy hour drinks, but, you know, just that meaningful connection. I feel like I've completely ignored you seven. <laughs> and not only have I ignored you, but I've had my back to you the entire time. So I'm going to sit here until you ask a question. <laughs> okay, I'll go first. Um, nice my question for you guys is, what is happiness? No, I'm just kidding. That's <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> no, I was going to ask, um, one, just thank you. I, I think you sharing stories that are very personal is really authentic. I mean, to, you know, what's um, on the title of this book. Um, my question is, like, what surprised you when you wrote this book? Obviously, you know, your prior delivery happiness just was hugely impactful in, in, for people, for companies in many different ways. And as you wrote this one and as you went through, like what was kind of an aha that you had that you didn't expect? Hmm. How fucking hard it was gonna be. I think like when I first started, like I had a nice, neat, tidy outline and like publishers like, you know, signed off on it, contracts ready. This was January, 2020. And then we all get 2020 would And then, so that outline was like, you know, back to that Mike Tyson quote, <laughs> I got punched in the mouth. And then it was kind of like, how do I even, like what you were asking, like do this justice, you know, do our work justice, do Tony justice, do what everyone is feeling in this reset of humanity justice. So I think because those questions in my head got so big, I just didn't realize how hard it would go to try and capture that. Um, I honestly don't even know if I did, but I tried my best is all I know. But thanks for the question. Please. Um, so if I capture beyond happiness and, and the definition that you have, I, I think it's so beautiful. It's about the 50-50 of life, that life is beautiful and joy and it's hard and loss and grief and all the things is that does that kind of sum it up in a, in a big picture mm -hmm. i'm curious as to like how you would advise leaders to kind of bring this into the day-to-day -day with their teams i mean i'll just share something that i do with my team we start off meetings with like tell me one word around how you're feeling right now mm -hmm. um and so, but I'm super curious, like what, what advice yeah. do you have for us as leaders to kind of really push that? And, yeah. and, and, and also too, like we live in a society where we're not taught how to feel our feelings. It's not okay to like talk about how we're feeling. And so I'm, I'm curious as to like how you also think about that too. Mm. Awesome. Yeah, really good questions. Um, so I love the fact that you already do that. You know, I just ask that one question before you dive into the agenda. Like, you know, just really quickly, how is everyone feeling right now? You get that pulse and it feels nice, right? Um, how we get deeper into those kind of conversations is um, it's actually a dig, like a click down in, in what I've been talking about in these purpose and values type of exercises. So one of the exercises, and you actually mentioned it, the happiness heartbeat one, which is go have everyone in your team go through their own heartbeats in life, their own highs and lows, and not just necessarily at work. I mean, it can, but I think it goes deeper if you go life. So, you know, what we're top three highs, top three lows, and then ask everyone, like, what are you seeing in trends? You know, what are the values that are coming up? What are the people that are there or not there? And then you actually get like a synthesis of that snapshot of that person, what means the most to them, knowing that happiness is not just defined by our highs, but it's also defined by understanding our lows. So by doing that sort of as a foundational exercise, then that question becomes even that much more meaningful. Um, and to get everyone to participate, it's like just democratizing it all so that everyone has a voice, whether it's through chat or Google Doc, or just like letting them, asking everyone, encouraging them to, so let's do this homework. And, you know, this is not just like a fleeting thing. We're actually going to keep on revisiting this. It's part of our, 
um, well, process part of how the way we work. Um, so as long as you're serious about it, people will actually be serious about it too. Yeah, of course, there's a question. <laughs> not yet. Is it on now? Yeah. Yes. There we go. Uh, this is not off topic, but I think a lot about my 15 year old in high school. And when he comes home and he feels like he's anything but authentic, kind of like what you were saying, and he's being told what classes to take, and life is just. And then I think he's going to hit this world that maybe does become more authentic in the workplace. And I was just wondering, like, if you, if you think about that, like, you know, I know it's not the job of your book or of you, but like, how do we address the sort of dichotomy between us being authentic and our children being in a world and an education system that's designed not to be authentic, truly? That's, I think actually I'd be I'd be curious what you think because you have a teenager, right? <laughs> okay, asshole. <laughs> um, now, I'm not, now I'm not the only asshole in the room. <laughs> no, well, it, it'd be hard for me to answer because I wasn't paying attention. So. <laughs> you no, know, you talked about your, your 15 year old kid and. and yeah. Yeah, ask the question again. I'll answer. All right. I wasn't paying attention. So, the, for those who are actively listening, uh, <laughs> I'm being authentic, Jen. Yeah. <laughs> Take that. <laughs> I love you, man. I actually am happy to answer, but you'd have to ask, ask again. Uh, would do you mind, or do you want me to? Sure, take your time. No, I think it's a good okay, question. I don't need a mic. Okay, thank you. <laughs> My question for those people who can uh, pay attention this time was uh, that, you know, that my 15-year-old comes home a lot and he feels like he's anything but authentic at school, that they're teaching anything but sort of like authentic things, you know, and he's going to at some point hit a world and maybe be, you know, in a leadership role and it'll catch up to him then. But I, I sort of just look back and I think like, what is our sort of like responsibility perhaps as a society to not wait for the school systems or something to text, catch on to this? So kind of part, I was wondering, do you work with educational institutions and schools? And I think it, you know, it'd be interesting to see like, how do you start sending this stuff downhill so that it hits them before they, you know, end up in the work world? Because it's just a really important thing. It'd be really powerful for young people yeah. to hear some of this. Let me just start, and, yeah, and yeah. then you, you can bring it home. Um, I think you're lucky and fortunate that your child is already thinking about what that even means at that age. And so I think the, the sooner, the earlier that that becomes normal, that becomes a normalized question or a normalized way to think um, it will bode well for him. Him um, in the future, I think when you start that early, um, it makes for a more robust human being uh, as 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 they age. And I think, like for me, it didn't it didn't happen until much much later. And I think I think um, I think you know the fact that your your child is already there, at least asking the questions and it's allowing you to guide. Uh, guide him and guide his thoughts around what that means, and I think I think in I think he'll be you know ahead of the game when as he as he as he gets older and matures. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, when you were asking that question for some reason, maybe because we just actually is kind of timely got a email from the LA uh, LA School Unified Unified School District. Yeah, we've been probably working with you know. As I said, companies and governments and all that, but that was like first our first like big uh, potential contract with the school just district. So it's cool to see that tides are changing around the whole topic. Um, for, so maybe that's the reason why when you're asking the question, I was thinking that uh, what's that? Is it Public Enemy song? Fight the power. <laughs> We're really just gonna fight the power. Um, 
and it goes back to like no pressure, but you and the people that he surrounds himself with. And it makes such a huge difference just to be honest about like, it's not easy um, by any means, uh, but we're just going to do this together. And this is how, like, this is how I'm going to help as much as I can. Um, but I think this generation that's coming up they're they're pretty incredible. Like they're not, no offense millennials, but you know, Gen Zers, they, they wear five hats of working at different jobs because they know they need to make, you know, ends meet, but they do it intentionally because they are, they want to wear five hats. So I don't know. I, I think there's a, like a lot of promise knowing that systems are changing, but it comes from, you know, you and, and the people that uh, are in your community. Are we getting close to so. that point of no return? You mean the bar? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> You okay? Uh, Is there anything, Jen? Uh, you wanna, you wanna impart? You know, and because I do wanna, I do. There is one thing I wanna say before before we get off. But um. yeah, no, I'm just. But thank you, sincerely. Uh, this has been a very unique uh, discussion, just because it's been like so real. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think I'm all about keeping the dialogue and knowing that this is all a journey. And just by the fact that each, every one of you made it a choice to come here for whatever reason, like I don't take that lightly. And I think that now more than ever, that the more we can create these kind of connections and continue it uh, in meaningful ways, um, that's what I'm here for. So, you know, I, I'll promise not to pour water on your head, but I promise to respond to your emails and, and help uh, any way I can. So thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to say that, you know, you are uh, you are fantastic. You are a lovely human being. And I have known you for quite some while, uh, a while now and have always cherished our friendship and you. Um, so I think in terms of you guys reading the book or caring about the book, you, you, you'll you get in, some insights into Jen that will be, um, fulfilling and um, and fantastic stories and who knew you were that funny, Jen? I didn't know because typically you aren't. Um, so that that part was great too. And uh, so so there's that. But the other part, the, the other fantastic thing about your book, Jen, is that it's so practical. There are things in it that you can take away and immediately implement implement with in in, in your company, but also personally. Um, because the idea around discovering your purpose and your values, that in and of itself is 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 important, and it's a, and it's something that we all don't 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 necessarily do it consciously, or purposefully, or intentionally. So uh, the fact that it allows for uh, and, it, and, you, and you may not get in the first chapter or the second or, or the hand you know the first handful of pages or the, even the second part part of it, but it's it's repeated so often. Um, that you start understanding really what you mean and what you're getting at. Uh, and, and so I think for that, and for a bunch of other reasons, it's quite practical. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy reading your book. Um, and even yes. though we're friends and I was supposed to, I kind of had to read it. Um, I really did. I actually, in, I, I, in fact, interestingly enough, I told a friend about it. He read it. He is a professor, was a professor at Stanford. Um, Cal PhD at Cal from Cal, and he said that he he had a class today. He told me today that he actually talked about your book in his class. So it is, no it's yeah, it's uh, it's fantastic, and I really I really would encourage you all to to read it, and you'll get a lot out of it. So. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you.